Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. We want to bring your attention to an important update for the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions F and H on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. We encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A box. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in your posts about the conference on social media to help spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GABMEC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after they have been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Adam Paris Gandola, the Vice President of Humane Society International, who is a gold sponsor organization of this year's GABMAC conference. He is here today to share his experience and perspective on rescuing responsibly the pitfalls of unofficial rescue and how to mitigate them. Adam, welcome. Hi, thank you. And, and uh, thank you all for joining for, for my, my talk. Um, so I'm going to go through these slides uh, and um, talk just a little bit about my experience and kind of, um, you know, what, what led me to, to think about, you know, bringing this, this topic up. Um, Oops, hold on here. Okay, so I'll start by saying, like, I, you know, was thinking about this this idea of of you know what what we might call an unofficial rescuer or people who show up, um, you know, to respond to disasters, kind of outside of the, you know, the official framework. But I will say, um. You know, we, we've seen this in in human rescue response as well as as animal rescue response. And I'll talk a little late, later about the, the Cajun Navy, which some of you, especially US attendees have probably heard of and, and kind of the story of the Cajun Navy. And, and um, because they're, they're a really good example of a, a group that kind of started unofficially and, and now has been kind of more wrapped up and, and brought into the sort of official fold. Um, however, you know, I realized when kind of making this definition that, um, the line can be very blurred, right? Like it's very clear, you know, uh, so I work uh, in disaster response in the U.S. And, and also globally. And and in the U.S., you know, we have a very robust structure and, and have emergency management and uh, very, you know, strong procedures that, you know, work better, better or worse, depending places like Florida and California have like uh, amazing, um framework for responding to disasters that includes you know animal response uh, other places uh for example in the the floods in eastern kentucky last year um you know a, a little less familiar with dealing with disasters and they didn't have quite as robust a framework for that but then when you go into um you know other you know some countries in the world they they really don't have especially when it comes to animals much of a framework and so it can become very blurred as to you know what is an official response and and as an animal you know welfare group how do you sort of respond uh if, you know officially so um i think you know really the the idea is about re you know how do you responsibly respond to these disasters um and you know whether you're sort of official or unofficial so uh, that's that's kind of the framework I'm going to talk about it in. Um, but when we talk about you know types of what 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 I'm thinking of as unofficial responders, like 
really we're talking about, you know, individual volunteers who, you know, may be from maybe local volunteers, maybe international volunteers that come to assist. They really don't have an affiliation. They may not have skills, um, but they're they're well-meaning and well-intentioned folks. There are also groups, again, both local or, you know, international that may respond, um, but may not also, you know, they have various skill levels. Some some groups show up, they've had a lot of experience in disasters. Other ones don't. Some groups show up, they have a real, they're local, they have a knowledge of the, you know, the language and the culture, others don't. Um, and then the third one, I was trying to figure out what to call them, and I'm calling them social media types. Obviously, you know, I, I've been my first disaster was Katrina. So that was almost 25 years, I mean, 20 years ago, almost. And so over the years, you know, since Katrina, social media has obviously exploded and, and there is a huge, you know, increase of folks who kind of show up. Uh, they maybe do, do some crowdsource fundraising to be able to fund their response and they're very heavily visible on social media. And, you know, these are, again, different individuals with different motivations. Um, but I've kind of separated them out because they're, they're a much more public uh, kind of individual response than, than your traditional individual volunteer who just, you know, kind of shows up and wants to help. So the first question is sort of, you know, why isn't any help helpful? Uh, and, you know, while it can always be helpful to have um, extra hands, uh, when people show up and they're not, they don't have skills and they're trying to sort of respond in ways beyond their skill level, let's say, uh, there's obviously safety issues. And this photo is not not somebody who is responding to uh, a disaster. This is rescue is rec rescuing somebody who is actually just trapped in their car, a regular citizen. But just as an example, you know, if people show up, um, and, you know, are, are responding, let's say doing water work, you know, in floods, uh, and they're not skilled, this is a safety issue for them, safety issue for the animal, and also uh, for rescuers, if that person gets in trouble, then rescuers have to pull themselves away from, you know, the in initial victims of disaster just to go and respond and, um, and now, you know, rescue the rescuers, so to speak. So, obviously safety issues similarly obviously people trying to you know that that aren't used to dealing with animals in stress coming in and trying to handle animals that are very stressed right they're not um regardless of whether they're a family pet or a farm animal they're not going to have the normal reactions that they necessarily would have every day in their home um there are also sometimes legal issues about um, who can respond, particularly, you know, in fires, there might be fire lines that, you know, can't be crossed unless you've had the training, uh, water work again, if you've had, you know, um, water rescue training or not. Um, and then, uh, there's what I, what I call the responsibility of care. So, um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about this when I get into, I mean, just do a few ex examples, case examples, but uh, this is the idea that, you know, if you show up and you start rescuing animals, but you don't have the sort of framework behind you to care for those animals, um, then, you know, that's that's kind of an irresponsible way <laughs> to show up and rescue. And, you know, oftentimes we think, you know, the rescuing the animal is the tough part, but it's it's not really the toughest part is 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 the care of the animal after the rescue right that's the long term what's going to happen with this animal are they going to be able to be reunited with their owner uh do they have an owner um if they don't if they're not going to be able to be returned to the community on some level then then where does this animal go um and then uh also there's a responsibility to the communities and the own and owners right so we need to you know be aware of you know, um, if we are, you know, going to be handling people's animals or community animals, right, they might be street animals, but they belong to that community. Um, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are uh, rescuing them in a way that doesn't necessarily take them completely away from people who, um, who may want those animals back. Uh, also, we sometimes see when people show up and they, you know, they're sort of sneaking around behind the authorities and 
um, not listening to or they haven't had the access or the briefing for the information on what they should and shouldn't be doing. You know, they're maybe breaking into homes to get animals out, but without proper permissions. Um, and then, you know, increasingly when we see people come, especially from other communities or other countries into into the affected area, there can be sort of a, a lack of sometimes cultural awareness and a lack of understanding the way that the, that community interacts with their animals may be different than the way you know, that your community um, interacts with animals and, you know, we need to be able to understand and respect that. So finally, you know, when people do show up, uh, you know, and kind of behave badly, as I put it, um, you know, kind of paints the whole field in a bad light and, you know, can can result in all access for even sort of official responders being um, denied to the area. Okay, so how does this play out in regards to animals? So um, there are a couple of different scenarios. There's wildlife considerations. I, I'm kind of separating out a little bit from domestic animal considerations. I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but there are some different considerations when it comes to wildlife, some different responsibilities than when we're talking about domestic animals, whether they're, you know, sort of pet animals or livestock. All right. So to get into the case studies, uh, as I said, Hurricane Katrina was sort of my first major disaster. Um, and uh, this was in 2005, of course, and I responded in, in New Orleans, which um, the entire, you know, much of the city had been flooded when the when the levees broke and most of the population had been um, evacuated uh, and they had sort of law enforcement all over the city. Um, they had checkpoints to enter the city to get in, but uh, it wasn't the strongest, I guess, uh, controls in terms of people coming in. Um, and the Louisiana SPCA was the lead agency, so we came in under the Louisiana SPCA. Many of us came with our own vehicles from our own agencies, and we would sort of that we would sort of write on the windshields, you know. Louisiana SPCA or LASPCA and uh, and be allowed access. Well, well, pretty quickly, you know, other sort of groups started showing up, other individuals that were kind of working outside the official response. And they very quickly figured out if they wrote this on their vehicles, they were allowed access to the city. So it, it kind of became um, a little bit crazy very quickly. Um, and we had, there were a, a quite a number of issues that arose um, there were groups that would come in, they would kind of go around, they were like, most of the houses were open. So when I say they broke into people's houses, because the human rescue had already gone through and like pretty much broken into every house to make sure there weren't human victims in them. Um, and so uh, people would gain access to houses, to backyards, and they were picking up animals and taking them out and, and, but they weren't taking them to the sort of official areas to take animals. So they were taking them off, often back to their, their own facilities or to sort of alternative shelter, temporary shelters that were set up and they never got in the system. And this made it very, very difficult to get, to reunite them. So for many, many owners, um, you know, they, it took them even months to, to track down their animals if they were able to do it at all. Um, and, you know, I even ran into people who, you know, were still in, they never evacuated, but they left to go to the store. There's one guy I'll never forget. And he left to go to the store and he came back and his dogs had been rescued. Um, and it, it took him quite a while to track those dogs back down. Uh, and this, this, this photo, I think is a great example. I mean, this thing, it got a little out of control, like, uh, people, you know, spray painting on houses, like not all of these houses were destroyed. Some people were going to come back to their houses and they were like, you know, sort of spray painted all over. I saw houses where, you know, dogs had died, you know, they were chained and they died chained in the backyard and people had spray painted like, uh, you know, dog murderer lives here on their house. And, um, and then the other side to it was rescuer safety, right? So there were all these individuals all over the city. Nobody necessarily knew where they were. Nobody was tracking them. You know, um, there are a couple of instances where people sort of disappeared, like their friends couldn't find them. They didn't come back. Uh, eventually, luckily, I think all of these 
people ended up being okay. They just gotten out of contact, but there was no real accountability to, to keep track of folks and make sure that they were safe. Um, so that was, uh, that was kind of my first experience. And, and after that in, in, uh, in the, in the US and even actually in the disaster itself, I, I first responded very initially um, right after the the hurricane hit. And then I came back for a second wave. And by the time I came back, they were actually instituting like they had a printer and they were making passes um, to credential people to be allowed into the city. Uh, and then within the US, there was a lot of changes that came after Katrina um, in terms of response. So the second example that I'm going to talk about is the uh, Australia wildfires. Um, we responded on Kangaroo Island, which, um, you know, I'd say there was a, a mix. And those of you who are Australian probably know there are there were um, provinces or, you know, where or states where um, the things were very tightly controlled. I would say that was not the that was not the situation on Kangaroo Island. There, there wasn't a lot of control there. Um, people were kind of like you know, allowed to do what they, you know, just come in and, and, and do the work they wanted. There weren't a lot of um, folks that showed up, especially initially. We were there for quite a while, but slowly, um, you know, other groups and individuals started showing up. And the, the reason I picked this disaster as an example is because it was really, you know, primarily on Kangaroo Island affecting wildlife, right? Affecting the koala population. There's large, um, there's a lot of eucalyptus farms there, and so there are a lot of koalas. And one of the things with wildlife, and I don't know if any of you guys were watched Dave Pauly, my colleague Dave Pauly's presentation, but he touches on this, right? So with wildlife, it's really important to think about, you know, um, even more important, I'll say, because it's important with other animals too, like does this, do we really need to intervene here with this animal? So there were folks that started showing up and there were like tree climbers that came to give their services and there were like people that showed up with drones and they were like any koala they saw that they spotted, they would go, these tree climbers would climb up these trees regardless of whether there was still like, uh, um, you know, food access for those koalas in those trees and we're just sort of snatching them up and taking them taking them in and when it comes to wildlife of course you know it's uh it's it's always it's always risky to you know bring a wild animal into captivity it causes them unnecessary it causes them stress whether necessary or unnecessary right it causes them stress some animals depending on the species can be very severely affected and um you know it can even die from the stress luckily koalas seem to be pretty pretty resilient when it came to that. But if you start looking at, you know, kangaroos and wallabies and these, these types of, of animals, it's, it's much riskier than when you bring them in for their, for their own health. Um, and so it's important that people understand, you know, what are the signs for, you know, a wild animal that needs, that does need to be removed. And is that animal in a situation where they're able to access food? Um, we were putting out water stations, uh, and then they don't necessarily need to be relocated. Um, and of course, you know, some understanding of handling of wildlife is important, not just to protect the res the rescuer, but also for the animal themselves to be able to do it in as low stress a way as possible. Um, okay, so two more quick examples. Uh, Ukraine is was a little bit of a different situation. Again, there really was no official response. It was widespread. It went, you know, through uh, uh, border countries, Ukraine itself. Um, and so, but the reason I, I picked this out as an example in terms of rescuing responsibly is that, you know, we, is that, of course, you know, people's good intentions to come we need to take these animals out of Ukraine and 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 save them. Um, and you know, for those of you who are familiar with Ukraine, there was uh, a lot of shelters that some of which housed thousands of animals prior to the war starting there. And so there became this this rush that the EU initially, you know, uh, relaxed their entry requirements for refugees coming from with animals um, from Ukraine. But there were a lot of groups that started, you know, coming in and bringing out large numbers of animals. Sometimes these animals weren't necessarily housed in the, in, in the 
in the greatest way in terms of disease prevention. So it did cause like a, 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 a large uptake in, in, in disease spread. And, um, you know, eventually the authorities were getting very uh, uh, worried. And so they kind of shut down that that avenue to to move animals out and you know it just then affects people also trying to get out with their animals um and so yeah it just it just wasn't a great you know i understand the response but it wasn't a great um just moving out hundreds of animals was i don't think was the best solution um and then there were you know groups that were taking out animals with no real plan for long-term care um some of these were being set up across the border in temporary shelters. Um, some were being, you know, sort of left with with local groups across the borders. And um, so it's always important, as I said before, like the the rescuing is uh, is the easy part. It's the long term care that's difficult. So that needs to be taken into consideration. And then finally, Hurricane Dorian, which is in the Bahamas, uh, we responded on Abaco Island which was pretty, pretty destroyed, I will say, by the hurricane. As you can see in this picture, this used to be a kind of like, um, you know, housing area, like with kind of shacks that were built up around it that was completely wiped out there on Abaco Island. And uh, there was an official response led by IFA. We came in under IFA. We worked with them. But because it was very close to Florida, there were some, some folks that were coming in, uh, even flying their own planes in. And, uh, you know, taking animals, like collecting animals up again and flying them off the island, but uh, without, you know, really registering them in any way. And one thing we found by going around the island and talking with people is that, you know, a lot of times, like in a block, you know, there might be several families that had evacuated. There were dogs roaming around, but if you talk to people remaining on the block, you know, they're like, yeah, that's my neighbor. He left, um, but I'm watching his dogs. I'm feeding them. You know, he'll he'll get them when he can. Uh, a lot of those dogs lived, this is an island, right? A lot of those dogs lived kind of free roaming anyway. And so there was a real, some, with some folks, a, a sort of lack of understanding that they, just because the dogs are were free roaming doesn't mean that they were in, in need of rescue. And you really need to take the time to investigate each situation and see, is this animal need to be removed? Sometimes we would, you know, leave food and other things, try to talk to neighbors and understand, is there someone responsible for caring for these animals or do they need to be removed? And then if removed, um, can we do that through the official system so that then people can get directed um, to the right place if they're looking for their animals. Okay, so um, just to uh, move into considerations um, to if uh, avoid causing chaos if you self-deploy or if you're deploying to an area, it's not really an official response to get into. So again, in absence of an official system, it's always good to check in with local authorities and groups like, who, you know, who are the groups that are there? Who are the groups that seem to be kind of leading the effort? And can we check in with them? Um, we always let the authorities know that we're there, what they're, we're there for, even if they don't have like an official system for us to be there. Um, just we want to make sure we have their permission and, and they understand we're there. Um, you know, uh, again, our, our firm belief is that unless an animal is in imminent danger or injured, we want to keep that animal in their community. So can we do feeding in place? Um, you know, is it safe for the animal to stay there if we can provide food and water until people are able to, to return? And this is for community or street animals as well as, as people's pets, because plus it's a lot more resource intensive to take that animal out of their community and, and house them elsewhere. I mean, sometimes you have no choice either because the animal's injured or ill or it's not a safe situation, but as much as possible, try to keep them in their community. Can we just provide uh, support to the community members that are still in the area for them to be allowed to care for their, able to care for their own animals? Um, when we're looking at transporting animals out of a disaster zone uh, to a different area, right? Not like into a temporary shelter, but like to, for rehoming, we try to really focus on animals that existed in care already before the event. So they were maybe um, belong to a shelter. They've been there for a long time. And then, and then that shelter can be allowed to have space to take in 
animals that might be affected by the disaster. So it gives the people opportunity to find their animals. Um, you can, you know, utilize existing volunteer opportunities as an individual to help, right? So there are often, you know, uh, local groups or, you know, national groups or international groups will have an avenue for volunteers um, to be able to help, but to do it in a coordinated way with the rest of the effort. Uh, always follow the instructions of the authorities because, um, you know, it, we're, we're only there because of uh, 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 they allow us to be there essentially. Um, and then the, my last thing, of course, on this is, is, is again, don't rescue the animal unless you're prepared to care for them because we don't want to be, you know, sort of then dumping them on local shelters or um, or others to care for. OK, uh, so um, also a note just for everyone, I just like to point out, um, you know, social media content, you know, comes a lot of times from 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 folks who are there sort of self deploying. I mean, obviously, all official, most official groups also. Um, you know, use social media, but, you know, we all know, uh, you know, you can't believe it. everything you see in the media and social media. Um, you know, we've seen instances where people, you know, they've been posting, they're rescuing all these animals, but then we know behind the scenes, they've actually just dumped them on a local group to deal, to deal with the aftermath. So, um, I always say use care and what you share because, uh, we don't want to, you know, sort of encourage this behavior inadvertently. Um, and okay, so trying to finish up here. So, uh, you know, knowing all this, how can we work to channel the good intentions of people in the proper direction? Just keeping people out is difficult. It's not always going to work. So, so how can we try to channel the good intentions of these folks? Um, well, you know, the outcome of that is going to depend a bit on the responder themselves. Some people really just do want to help and they're happy to be kind of absorbed into whatever coordinated effort is happening. Uh, others, not so much. They have no interest. They don't want to follow the rules. They don't want to, you know, um, so it's going to be a little dependent individually. Um, but but uh, yeah, just real quick for the Cajun Navy, I think was just a great example. So the Cajun Navy is basically just a bunch of folks in the South uh, of the United States that have boats. And they started showing up at disasters because there, there often was like more people needing rescue that, that could, could be gotten to quickly. And so they showed up and they were going out and rescuing people. And, um, you know, this effort really grew. And the uh, so most of the jurisdictions down there in the south, you know, they made a real effort instead of just sort of like, you know, throwing them out to say like, you know what, we, we recognize that we need this extra help. And so, you know, we're going to bring them into the fold. And so they started, you know, having contacts where they could come and they could come to the official briefings and they would, you know, get assignments like everyone else. And they kind of managed to bring them into the fold. And now they're really an amazing and effective group of uh, individual independent rescuers that come and help during particularly flooding disasters with you know in the southern US um we also need to be prepared to handle those walk walk on volunteers and provide on the spot training so we know these folks might show up how are we going to deal with that we need to think about that how do we bring them into the fold what can we have them do um you can use a credentialing system of sorts to easily and visibly see who is cleared to be there um because really, even unskilled individuals can be helpful. There's always more than enough work to go around. I also think that sometimes having folks from outside of that are kind of new to animal disaster response, they often come with like a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts and different backgrounds. And, you know, they can come up with some really innovative ideas. When we responded in Turkey, a guy showed up, he was a building engineer, he had a drone, he just kind of came, he was from England. Um, and he ended up hooking up with our, our our team that was there and he provided invaluable assistance. You know, first of all, the drone was amazing to be able to go up at, you know, and see see what was in these buildings. And second, he was a structural engineer. So he had some understanding of which buildings might be safe to go in and which ones weren't. Um, and then just to say, like, it's always if you're you know, if you are a group, it's always good to 
to avoid, try to avoid engaging with volunteer, I mean, individuals engaging in risky, unethical or illegal activities because, you know, you don't really want to be associated with that. Um, and if you are the authority there or you're connected with the authority there, if people really are causing havoc and creating a problem, then um, it's best to make them leave. Okay. I am just, uh, my last slide here is just uh, this legal and policy angle, which was kind of the theme here in the conference, um, which is to think about, are there avenues through legislation and public policy, policy to address this issue? Of course, there's credentialing. There's also um, team typing, which is just a way of kind of cataloging that these folks have the 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 proper training to go and respond, you know, say to a fire or to a flood event, um, something like that. Uh, and then, you know, I'm not a huge fan of penalties, but at times penalties may be appropriate for folks that are going in, particularly sore spot of mine, removing animals um, and just sort of making a snap judgment that like this animal needs to be saved. Or sometimes people have the attitude, well, these people left without their animals, they don't deserve to have them and they sort of take them away um, and essentially steal the animal. Um, so there may be instances where that's appropriate. Okay, well, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. I tried to get through this as quick as possible. Thank you all for, for bearing with me. <laughs> Adam, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple questions. The first one is for the Australian wildlife response. Did you come already knowing um, how to handle and treat wildlife or did you get training? Did you work with local supervision? And was there some sort of guidance or best practice documentation available before you arrived? So, yeah, um, so we, we came fairly early. Uh, the fires are still burning on, on Kangaroo Island um, when, when we first arrived. Uh, it was through our HSI Australia office. And we are just very lucky. My colleague, Kelly Donathan, who, who um, you know, uh, heads up our disaster services. She has a long, long history of, of uh, working on um, captive wildlife, captive exotics, and different sanctuaries and centers. Um, and she has a vast knowledge. And so she was really our uh, kind of guide. So, I mean, there were certain things like I, I was in animal control for years. So, you know, there are certain things with wildlife that, you know, is fairly consistent across species, right? Like just the approach, like the way that you think about wildlife in these settings um, that I was able to utilize. Had I ever handled a koala before? No. <laughs> uh, had I ever seen one outside of a zoo? No. <laughs> um, so, so that was new to me, but, uh, but, you know, because, because through Kelly's guidance, we were really able to understand now the treatment, we were very lucky um, the the Kangaroo Island Wildlife Park there was kind of the center where vets came from around Australia to um, provide the care. So luckily we didn't have to provide the medical care, right? We just needed to understand how to properly handle them, how to make those decisions to remove them. And then those vets provided the care and the expertise on that end. Wonderful. We did have another question. Disasters response and recovery needs a long-term commitment and support. Donations management is paradynamic. What is your experience in this regard? In terms of donations management? Right. So your your thought is if don't rescue the animal unless you have plans mm -hmm. to care for it. And a large part of that is the financially food, water, veterinary care, housing. Um, what is your experience? Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a really good good question. And I think, you know, this is the part a lot of people don't think about when they go in, you know, is is what is it going to take to to provide that kind of care? And so, um, you know, we we are like I obviously work for a very large international organization. I have the luxury of that, but I can say from our end, when we respond, for example, in 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 Turkey, our response there was in Antakya, which was a city that was was pretty much completely destroyed. Um and, uh, you know, we went initially, we had three waves of teams that went, did search and rescue. These were people, people were 
calling essentially um, asking for someone to go and look for their animal, mostly cats, because when the earthquake occurred, people could often grab their dogs, but cats, as you know, hide. So a lot of cats um, were inadvertently left behind and, and, and we were looking for them, but that's only the beginning, right? So then these animals, so, so we actually weren't then after a few weeks weren't on the ground, but we still are providing, we have sort of a six month to one year plan with the local veterinarians that we were working with to provide that support. Um, that's the unfortunate thing about disasters or you know crisis, because the same thing happened in Ukraine, right? There's an initial flood of money, but the, the, the long-term care and recovery for these communities and these animals goes on and the public interest dries up, right? And so it's harder to get donations for those critical efforts later on, um, you know, and, uh, you know, there's no, there's no easy solution to it. I think there are, you know, sort of some funding avenues through foundations and, th and, and things like that. I mean, um, that have provided a lot of support um, for those efforts. And, you know, I would say the more, you know, the social media fundraising is going to be in the beginning, but if you can develop sort of more um, larger, like what do, what do you call them, sort of like high value donors or, you know, donors, like th those donors are usually more interested in the strategy and understanding, and they're not just necessarily donating, you know, like the social media because they, they saw this animal being rescued. And so a lot of times there are people out there with funding that will understand the longer term strategy. And, you know, once the sort of sexy part of the disaster has passed, um, will provide support for those efforts. Absolutely. It is um, much like, like anything, there's, you know, the the quick click $10, $15, $25 donors. And then there are your recurring donors that understand the long-term needs yeah. of the organization. And absolutely. Uh, you mentioned that many times these unofficial rescuers will remove area animals from the area. Have you had any success or conversations with local jurisdictions as to how to help manage that? Does that end up becoming strictly a function of the animal groups? We expect you to keep an eye on, on the animals or have you succeeded in involving perhaps local law enforcement, anyone, um, anything along those lines? Yeah. So, I mean, it depends a lot on, that, you know, where it's, it's a occurring, um, you know, and as to how overwhelmed I'd say that the local <laughs> authorities are, um, you know, like I would say in Abaco Island, they were pretty overwhelmed with what was happening and, and we're not going to be super available to help on that front. But certainly, you know, in the U.S., um, you have not only the local, you know, law enforcement, but you have the state department of ag, state vet usually who really sets those parameters as to when an animal can be like rehomed or relocated. Um, but that's not, that's not where most countries are at, I would say, right? So, um, but local law enforcement can be very helpful, especially if you have really good relationships, if there's particularly problematic individuals, um, and you're working closely with local, you know, law enforcement in, um, in Antakya, it was the, the the special forces and the army that was providing most of the security. And they did start to kind of crack down on people um, going out, but but they they didn't really have a credentialing system, but they kind of knew, you know, like um if you if you were like, yes, I'm with, you know, the vets. The vets were set up in a park and we were camping there with them. And then they had a great relationship with special forces. So they were like, great, you guys can go, you know, go ahead and um but uh you know so so yes you can you can use local law enforcement um it just especially in those early days is very chaotic but then over time they tend to get more organized and and they can they can be very helpful in sort of removing problematic individuals for sure wonderful thank you so much for being here and certainly a challenging um situation because people do have good hearts and the best intentions yeah most of the time oh. And with just one more thing, I was just going to say that the next panel that's coming up is also on, on this, you know, issue. And I think we'll bring some perspectives, some really interesting perspectives from like a wide 
array of folks on that panel. So if you're interested in the topic, I, I recommend you join that panel too. Yeah. Yes, definitely stick around.